Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. This session has been recorded for our students' benefit. Before we could start with our session, request one of us to lead us in prayer, please. Can we pray? Yes. Yes, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and care. We thank you um, that you love us to an extent that on a daily basis, you write us on a list of those that are going to wake up. And we wake up and we run the day and we sleep. And then the thing continues. Sometimes we even forget how much you are doing for us in this. But Lord, we come with a word of thanks, with a token of appreciation to you, that thank you. Thank you for your love, thank you for your care. Now that we are here for this mentoring hour, Lord, that you will now be with us, for you are the greatest teacher. You are the one who teaches, but your teaching causes learning. Lord, I pray that even as we are here, cause learning for the good of your, for the glory of your name and for the good of our lives. Amen. Bless us, anoint us, equip us. For in Amen. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. So we take this opportunity week after week to ask questions, share our interest, and discuss on any topics that's in our mind. So please stay, uh, please feel free to post your questions on chat, or you can also unmute and ask your questions. And we have a faculty team who can assist us or help us to answer those questions. So I encourage each of us to take this time to ask your questions and share your thoughts so we all can learn together. Okay, uh, we have Charles ask a question. Should Christian believer take a COVID-19 jab? Is it a mark of the beast? Can I request Pastor Nancy to take up this question? Uh, okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, yeah, so uh, Charles, I think a couple of weeks ago we had uh, the same question uh, on this call to which we said that COVID-19 jab, uh, it's a vaccination to prevent the COVID infection. Now, uh, the mark of the beast, uh, well, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, something that um, uh, will be given as a sign of, uh, you know, um, like allegiance to the beast and also that is kind of used to do business. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, as far as COVID-19 uh, jab is concerned, you know, we know that uh, uh, none of that is is uh, mm, associated with with this vaccination. So it's uh, it's just a medical thing. It helps us stay safe. So yeah, uh, COVID-19 jab is not a mark of the beast. Uh, I would like to say that much. I think uh, others could add to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. And yeah, any other faculty would like to add to it, please? Jean or Paul can add. Okay, uh, so uh, Charles, did that answer your question?
Charles, did that answer your question? Mm. Okay. Yeah, he said uh, yes on the chat. And... Okay, yes, yes, Pastor. Okay. Um, I see another question from Elisha. What is the great white throne and judgment seat of Christ? Um, any faculty would like to take this up, please? Pastor, you would like to answer well, this question. Uh, yeah, I could, but Paul, do you want to give it a try? Sure, Pastor. Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. Sure, Pastor. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Elisha, for that question. Very briefly, uh, now the judgment seat of Christ is uh, is a is the judgment of rewards, also known as the bema seat, where uh, all of us as believers we will stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ. Now. This judgment is only for the believers, and it's also known as a judgment of reward. So, um, uh, so all of us will be—we uh, all know that grace is free, but rewards vary. And so, we will be rewarded for uh, what we have done here on earth. So, the judgment seat of Christ is for the believers, and the great white throne judgment uh, in the book of, uh, towards the end in the book of Revelations. Uh, is for those uh, who are unbelievers. So it is not a judgment of rewards, but it is a judgment for the unbelievers. And uh, we see that that's the place where, uh, you know, uh, God will judge those who have been, who have, you know, not accepted the Lord. And uh, uh, and so the, the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. The great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. The judgment seat of Christ is uh, of uh, the judgment of rewards, meaning uh, we will be rewarded for what we have done. The great white throne judgment will be for unbelievers, and it will be a time of judgment for them. Uh, uh, and so I will, I will leave it at that. Anybody else would like to please add in? So, thank you, Elisha. Thank you. Pastor Nancy, you would like to add to it? Uh, sorry, Diana. You know, I'm not very uh, okay. uh, yeah, good with this. So thank you so much. Pastor, you would like to add on? Um, yeah, I think Paul Paul uh, gave the, you know, the concise, complete answer. I'm just typing in some references on where we find this. So. Yeah, okay. uh, Paul's done, covered it. OK, yeah. thank you, Pastor. Elisha, I hope that answered your question. Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Okay. Yes. Thank uh, you. I'm looking for Ashes. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. So please feel free to post your questions, or you can unmute and ask questions or share thoughts. Okay, we have a question. Okay, we have another question from Elisha. Who's considered a bad minister? Who's considered a bad minister? I open it to our faculty team. Anyone would like to pick it up, please? Yes, Rupa. Jean or Pastor Nancy, you would like to answer this question? Uh, 
I think I'll just get some. Stuff. Yes, Pastor Jakes. Yeah, um, just one um, scripture, one aspect of it is um, like, I don't know if it's specifically referring to, um, you know, um, some passage of scripture, what Elisha asked, but uh, um, Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, like Paul writes about, you know, when comparing himself, his ministry with others uh, during that time. So uh, verse 17, Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, but we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So, um, so here he's saying that um, you're not, you know, adulterating or uh, uh, literally, you know, doing something to sell the word of God, you know, not for monetary gain uh, at the expense of, um, uh, you know, um, um, short changing in the sense uh, the, the the people who are being ministered to are not actually being benefited, right? Uh, compromising uh, in the message or diluting the message. So he's saying we're not peddling the word of God, but of sincerity. So I guess one aspect is um, to um, minister the word of God in in uh, in its fullness and uh, with sincerity, and not for you know with wrong motives, um, and also not with uh, the motive of uh, gain. Uh, of you know uh, gain for oneself and also not um, compromising on the message of the word that is being uh, ministered so this is one aspect and of course when we go through um, you know all the epistles of Paul it, it talks about how one needs to be uh, and especially first Timothy and second Timothy um, how one needs to be a minister of God so I guess the opposite of that it would be you know uh, how not to do that would be uh, being a bad minister yeah so I'll I hope that helps, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope, Elisha, I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, we have uh, regarding the dream interpretation from Herbert. Uh, there's a dream that he often has a soldier come from nowhere and start chasing and sometimes shooting at them and we run away. Uh, that could be what could be its interpretation. I open it to our faculty team. Anyone would like to pick this question and give our interpretation to Herbert? Um, Herbert, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, if if I were in your place and having a dream like this, that's repeated um, I would look at it in uh, you know one of two ways one is the situation in which uh, I am in and uh, you know if uh, how much you you are in Rwanda right if is that right I forget okay you're in Rwanda so, you're in Rwanda, so. yeah so um, so um, or, you know, if if there's a lot of conflict happening around you, that's like you know this. Um, then one is it could be uh, you know the dreams that I'm having. Of course, the, the, you know we have, it could be just because of what is happening around me. You know, and many of us have those kinds of dreams. You know that uh, it's influenced by the information that's coming to our minds uh, over and over again. So that could be the source. And so then I would just say, God, you know, when I sleep, I want to have peaceful sleep. I don't want to be troubled by these things. Um, I mean, the fact is they are troubling. I'm not saying uh, these are easy situations. These are disturbing situations. These are troubling situations. But then uh, that's when we have to pray and ask God uh, to give us peaceful sleep. That's one, one thing I would look at. The second is I would of course, check to see if it's actually from God, you know. Uh, now, because of the political situation, situation which I'm in, it's very likely it's influenced by the news and the things that I'm constantly hearing and listening and what's happening around me. But uh, I would also pray and say, God, is this from God? You know, one, one way to recognize if a dream is from God is, um, do we sense the presence of God when we wake up uh, in connection to that dream? If you don't sense the presence of God, you don't feel the hand of God on that dream, then just leave it aside. You know, and if it's happening over and over again, then you rebuke it. You command it to stop and ask God for a peaceful sleep. 
But if you do sense the hand of God on it, when you wake up, then that means God wants you to do something about it. And uh, which, you know, most likely we to pray for protection, to pray for peace in the land, which we can do anyway. You know, whether you have a dream or not, if there's a lot of these things going on in the land, definitely uh, we can pray for peace. We can pray for God's protection over our lives. Uh, you know, so that's how I would look at it. You know, first is determine if it's God or if it's just because of natural situations. If it is from God, what action does he want you to take? Which, uh, you know, some actions we know is that uh, we definitely have to pray. Uh, we definitely have to pray for peace and we have to pray for protection. Is that okay, Herbert? Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor. It will, it has really helped me. I will always pray for protection especially mm. yes. mm. back to you Diana. Yeah. thank you pastor thank you we have another question from divya when we are reminded of a bible verse repeatedly what kind of action need to be taken from one spot um Uh, Dana, I'll just add a few thoughts to yes, this. Please. Yes, yeah. Uh, thank you, Divya, for that question. Um, so, if we are reminded of a Bible verse repeatedly, uh, Divya, I think uh, like it's uh, it's good to um, pray and, and ask God. You know, uh, first of all, like uh, let let the word be in our hearts. We, uh, if it's uh, coming back to us again and again, uh, we could meditate on that uh, and we know that you know the holy spirit uh, he bears witness with our spirit so it could be a prompting of the holy spirit so one good thing to do would be to to think it through and pray uh, and if there is uh, an action required you know as the holy spirit ministers to us um, we we can act on it so it really depends on what it is that uh, is coming back to us again and again yeah, so I, I know answer is very general, but uh, does does it uh, help, Divya? Yes, yes, yeah, surely, Pastor. Thank you. Thank okay, you. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Thank Diana. you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Divya, for the question. Okay, uh, we have... Uh, Diana, I'll just add one more uh, point. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Divya, so the scripture shows us that the Holy Spirit is the one who reminds us of what, uh, uh, of what Jesus has taught. So... When it comes, I mean, I think I'm specifically speaking from experience. So when it comes uh, as a repetition, it could be depending on what, uh, uh, what verse it is that you're getting something that maybe to encourage you, to strengthen you, to lead you to a place of action, to maybe to stand forth or to work on something. So um, like Diana, uh, say, I'm sorry, like, like uh, Pastor Nancy said, that it is a reminder from the Holy Spirit for for you and specific to your situation uh, you know you take it either as an encouragement or as an obedience uh, or as a or as something that you may need to step back on or, or wait upon god so um yeah so because of, of that scripture in john that says holy spirit reminds us of things um that that jesus has taught yeah thank you yeah. thank you thank you Jean. Okay, we have the next question from Charles. Uh, there are many pieces of furniture in the wilderness uh, tabernacle. Then what were the elements in the Ark of the Covenant shadowing and how are they meaning today? Um, yeah, I open it to our faculty team. Would anyone would like to take this question? So, Charles, you're talking about um, the, um, the the items that were inside the ark. Is that what you're referring to, Charles? The, um, the, yes, yes. the So I'm just referencing Hebrews 9, um, uh, which talks about the, um, the pot of manna. And so basically inside, uh, there were three things that God told them to put it in, put in uh, a pot of manna. Uh, there was Aaron's rod, 
uh, uh, which which budded, and there was the tablets of stone, the second set of tablets that God gave uh, Moses. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, while the Bible itself doesn't interpret those as symbolic or as types for us, uh, we just go with the original meaning of what these stand for. So one is man, man I, is, is talking about God's provision for the people in the wilderness. Um, and uh, the rod, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, uh, it, it really is showing God's seal. You know, one of the things we can, meanings we can see there, of course, is God's seal of approval on whom he had appointed. You know, uh, and especially in the context in which that rod budded, it was a sign that, God had chosen Aaron and his descendants to be priests uh, for his people. So it's a sign of God's uh, approval. We could also see it as a symbol of supernat of the supernatural uh, because, you know, uh, the rod budded by supernatural work. And then there is the tablets of the commandments, which are an expression of God's law or God's word to us. Now, the Bible doesn't interpret it like this, right? Uh, so uh, we're just understanding it from its original context, the meaning of what it was. So you can imagine the ark, which is a symbol of God's presence, the box, um, which is, and inside the box are these three things. Uh, and if we, again, want to kind of draw meaning from it, uh, and I'm, again, I'm saying the Bible is not telling us this, but we are drawing meaning from it. We're saying that in the presence of God, there is provision there is God's affirmation of our calling. There is the uh, attestation of uh, signs, wonders, miracles. And in the presence of God, there is also the word of God uh, being given to us. Um, so, you know, uh, so I just want to qualify once again that this is not what the Bible is saying, but this is what the meaning we are deriving from these objects and the way, that, you know, the context in which it was given. Is that okay, um, Charles? So you have a question, further question on it? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank uh, you, Pastor. Pastor. Sorry, Dana. Go ahead, go ahead, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, Pastor, just in uh, uh, following up uh, to this answer, uh, I'm wondering, can we also derive, uh, because I've read in some places, they say because the tablet, uh, uh, you know, depicts the, um, uh, like, you know more um, the sinfulness of man um so like uh, can that also be because people say that uh, all these objects uh, talked about how god god needed to be there for man like man depended on god and the failings of man so on the ark of the covenant when the the blood was shed uh, you know on the mercy seat god god's presence would come there so through the through the blood like god sort of uh, covers the sin of man i've i've heard people say that what what would you mm. say to that? Yeah, so this whole idea of, um, so the idea of covering sin uh, versus cleansing sin, like in the Old Testament, uh, the language used is sin was covered. Mm. Uh, in the New Testament, the language used is sin is cleansed. Mm. So, uh, you know, because we are in the New Testament, we, we talk about being cleansed, which means it's not there anymore. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, you know, blessed is a man whose sin is covered, you know, so it's almost like saying, look, uh, it's just a temporary solution to sin, but the real solution is the cleansing of the real blood, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the blood of bulls and goats, which could not remit for sin. So it, you know, that's when the, in the Old Testament languages, okay, sin is covered, uh, because the blood of bulls and goats don't really remit for sin. Uh, but you come in the New Testament, it's cleansed. Uh, so that's the distinction. Uh, now, going back to your original point, uh, can the tablets of stone say that they speak about the sinfulness of man? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the Ten Commandments of you. Uh, none of us have been able, no, no human person is able to keep it. Yeah, I mean, if you if we want to look at that meaning, uh, I think it's fine, you know. Uh, 
but because it's in the presence of God, you know, in that ark, kept there, uh, I, I think it's a little misplaced. My feeling is, my feeling is, it's misplaced to say sin is kept in there in the presence of God. I would just look at it as this is God's law, God's command, God's word to man. Again, this is all meaning that we are trying to attribute to these things um, uh, and not, uh, you know, what scripture itself states. So we just have to be a little careful, I think. Yeah, sure, Pastor. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Pastor, for that uh, brief explanation. Uh, well, we have a question from Elisha. How do, we, how do you handle the situation when a senior minister wrong? A, a minister's wrong action comes to your attention. Okay, I open this question up to our faculty team. Pastor Jakes, you would like to answer this? Yeah, sure, Nancy. Um, so when a senior uh, minister's wrong action comes to your attention, okay, it also depends uh, like how you are like connected with the you know the senior minister like in the sense are you um are you part of the church are you a congregation member are you part of the you know the leadership team um well definitely uh, we can bring it to the person's notice uh, the, the the senior minister's notice um either in person or in writing to say okay explain the situation and say um you know this this is what i saw this is what i you know personally experienced and uh, and I, I just feel that it is um, it is wrong right uh, so one can do that and of course um, if that continues and if it's affecting uh, the, the 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 biblical pattern that we see as laid out by the lord right so um and also paul uh, reiterating that so we um and then we can um of course with one or two witnesses go and talk to that person again and say you know this is affecting us and this is not right and uh, um and yeah so we can we can take those steps um and um, what i would also say is um, maybe you know the senior person would have someone whom he or she looks up to and uh, we can also you know if this if it's a continuing thing and it's affecting a lot of people then um so the that can be brought to their notice you know um the maybe the senior pastor uh, senior minister has um, someone speaking into his or her life you know bring it to that person's notice and say you know this is what is happening um, but that is you know like a like a third step um, and and say uh, you know can you do something about it so yeah so that's what comes to my mind uh, about this yeah i hope that helps Uh, thank you, Pastor. Elisha, I hope that answered your question. Or you have a follow-up question. Uh, it's, it does. Uh, uh, my concern is um, when it happens to be part of the, of the leadership of the church. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Elisha. It's not very clear. Can you um, say that again, please? Yeah. I'm saying, I'm say, sorry, I'm saying uh, when you have things to be part of the church, and um, in the presence of uh, what Pastor said of um, going to the minister with a witness, would it mm -hmm. not amount to uh, not guarding the testimony of the minister? Is it not, uh, wouldn't it be better if you would go alone to speak to him? Now to go in the presence of another person. I just want to clarify on that. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. I mean, um, uh, the first step would definitely be to go alone and address that. And also, you know, um, to do all this in a very honorable way, you know, you uh, do it in an honorable manner, um, not to malign that person's life and character, but you do it in an honorable manner because you're, you know, the, the objective of it is, of course, uh, you bring it to light and you want to set everything right so that, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, and, and giving an opportunity for the person to explain also, you know, to see the perspective. Maybe we, we've been seeing it wrong, we've been reading it wrong. So to give uh, the other person an, uh, an opportunity to explain it, um, 
also you know but um so yeah definitely uh, doing it alone uh, as a first step and doing it in an honorable manner so that we are not uh, you know gossiping or maligning that person's life and character but um the objective is to set things right you know you want to um you want to set things right right uh, so that it's good for good for that person good for the, good for the congr- uh, i mean whoever is being minister to etc yeah uh, so in all this you know we do it in an honorable manner and not to uh uh not to malign uh, the person in any way yeah okay, and also thank you thank you thank you pastor we also have pastor ashish post a verse scripture on first timothy chapter 5 verse 19 to 20 elisha pastor would like to add to it um, yeah I, i just want to uh, share something uh, i've been uh, recently listening to a podcast uh, it's called um, it's from uh, let me type this out it's from uh, christianity today uh, they've been doing a series uh, it's a 15 part series so they've done up to about 12 uh, on the rise and fall of mars hill okay so you can you can look at it i mean you can go to christianity today's website or you can you know on your google podcast uh, um, any your podcasting app or you use i'm you i use google podcast which you can search for uh, rise and fall of marcel so basically this is a, a 15 part series uh, where they are documenting what happened to uh, a church called mars hill uh, it, it was based in seattle washington Uh, and this happened oh gosh forget the dates now uh so the church started i think in 1996 and went on for till about 2016 or something or 20 years or something uh but uh, they so they just kind of studying it's a real detailed study of what happened so this church at one point was the was was becoming the most you know influential church in the united states the pastor's mark triskel and uh, and it was based in seattle and it, it was just exploding you know the thing but the problem was um the pastor the leader was you know he he was very abusive very uh, just very abusive very um so you know, and uh, but the thing is the, the 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 leaders around him were didn't do anything right they didn't do anything and so things has got worse and worse and worse and worse um uh, until you know finally you know uh, so people in the congregation were, uh, when when you say abusive meaning i'm not talking about sexually abusive i'm talking about uh, uh, uh you know abusive in his words abusive in his treatment of people abusive in his mannerisms whatever you know it's it's it was a behavioral issue um and not not talk about sexual but just in the way in the, in the in the in the way he was treating people and the you know and and it reached a very very bad state and treating other pastors treating other leaders you know his church was growing you know i think it reached 15 uh, 15000 people or something like that so and there are many churches across the us so so because of that uh, because of the success in ministry uh, because of how how uh, how big it was growing uh people were not questioning you know uh because he had on one hand he had success he was very successful but on the other hand there were a lot of things behind the scenes that were just not right there were a lot of untruths that he was speaking uh, a lot of false things he was stating uh, even tried to manipulate uh, to get his book to be number one on the new york best seller list he used church money to make try and make that happen i mean a lot of you know wrong things happening but the problem was uh, you know when when they go they, when they, they this whole you know they're doing this whole study now on you know what went wrong the problem was nobody addressed the issue nobody from within the church and nobody from outside the church so there were a lot of other big leaders in america who were kind of you know who had relation who had friendship with this man but nobody had the courage to speak or at least confront him um, they did try some of the pastors local pastors in seattle got together and said look you know the way this pastor is conducting himself is very abusive 
he is very harsh in his preaching. He's very abusive in his preaching. So they did call him in. They did try to, but he wouldn't listen, you know. Uh, and eventually, he led to his own downfall, you know. Uh, and so, and the whole church collapsed overnight. The whole church collapsed. You know, can you imagine, like a, a you know, church of fifteen thousand plus people all across the U.S. just within like two months gone to nothing. So uh, it's a very interesting podcast. Uh, I mean, I'd encourage you to, I mean, if you really want to study of, you know, what contemporary church is like, this is very eye-opening. Uh, it's also very, very, you know, very, I would say, when I heard it, it was very sobering. You know, it's like, man, you need to look at yourself because if you're not watchful on your own life, no matter how successful you are, you could hurt a lot of people. So I just recommend that, uh, you know, if you're interested in listening to it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I think that is something very important that each of us can take some time to watch and listen to this podcast. We have another question or requesting for an explanation on Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, I can uh, read it from verse 18 onwards. Um, Nancy, I think, uh, uh, sorry, Diana, I think he corrected it. It's Second Peter chapter 1. Um, chapter 1, okay. Yeah, okay. 1 verse 20. Yeah. Yes, Pastor, sorry about it. I'll just put the verse scripture. One second, please. I'll just post the scripture. Yeah, Second Peter chapter one, verse sixteen onwards, sixteen to twenty. I'm sorry, there's something. Okay, please ignore the scripture verse. So, yes, uh, yeah. you got the scripture. One second. So, so while you uh, put the scripture, yes, then I'll just go ahead and just read yes, it out. Yes, um, you know, second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Um, uh, Peter uh, writing and saying, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So, um, you know, if, if we uh, see the context, uh, Peter is actually um, saying that, you know, we did not follow any cunningly devised fables, um, but it was indeed, um, you know, the word of God. It was attested because we saw uh, the Lord Jesus uh, was attested um, when he came. There was a voice from heaven, etc. And then he goes on to say that uh, we have this prophetic word confirmed. So and then um, he mentions that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation in the sense uh, it's it doesn't um, uh, the the mean the the prophecy is not the source of course is not uh, a man and also um, the the confirmation of it or the interpretation of it is not um, it's it's not from any private source or it's not from uh, a human being uh, because the origin is uh, not man it is actually God breathed. Uh, uh, and I think running parallel is that scripture, one well, first uh, Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen that that all scripture is God breathed, uh, and uh, so he's saying that prophecy, I'm sorry, prophecy never came by the will of man, so it cannot be of private interpretation. Um, so it is the Holy Spirit who gives us the meaning, the interpretation of um, of scripture he's the uh, he's the one who guides us into all truth he's the one who um you know uh, gives us the revelation and the wisdom he's the one who illuminates uh, scripture for us yeah and specifically prophecy as well yeah i i hope that helps elisha yeah thanks pastor elisha i hope that answered your question yes pastor this was the 
And could it also could it also be be that um I was reading one and uh, material and it it was saying the author was saying that um you don't you don't interpret one scripture uh, um, based on that scripture alone. You must do the interpretation in line with other scriptures in reference to other scriptures. So you don't pick one scripture and try to do an interpretation of it. You must consider what uh, other scriptures have said on the subject uh, of that particular scripture. What about that also? Yeah, the danger of lifting a particular verse or a scripture out of context, right? Um, but um, really look at the context of it. And of also, we have also learned that, uh, you know, scripture interprets scripture. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, uh, he's the author. And so there is a scripture adding to and giving um, uh, meaning to the, that particular verse. Uh, other, other portions of scripture are giving meaning and illuminating that particular verse. Yeah, so true. Okay, thank, Pastor, you. thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Elisha, for the question. We have another question from Sid Kenu. Um, many pastoral families, it happens like personal. I also have gone through it many times. That, but that okay, uh, I have also have gone through it many times that parents are very strong in spiritual life, but their children are not. And whenever any mishappening happens, we are blamed that it is because of you are not spiritually strong. So I read Bible, I pray according to my capacity, but in the end, we are blamed uh, how to handle this problem as we are facing personally. Okay. Can I request uh, Jean to take up this question, please? Um. Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, I may not be completely clear, but I, I think Sitkin, one of the um, biggest issues that we see in pastors' children is, um, uh, you know, they are under a lot of pressure to match up to their parents. And often you find that they may be living very hypocritical lives as a result of that, uh, and uh, um, you know, there could be I mean, many reasons to this, um, but uh, yeah, and I, I think in time, because uh, and also probably the pressure from the from the past, the preachers itself. I mean, their parents itself. Uh, they could they could also have questions about God, um, and you know, even their faith. Uh, really suffers, um, but I think uh, uh, you know the, the 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 need that they should be conforming to to the right things like their parents. But uh, uh, I, I think as a church we are all responsible um, because um, it, to, to know that each person is gifted or is called for for something whether it be a pastor's child or just another individual that they are called for some purposes of god and uh, to be able to give them that space that time that freedom to explore that while encouraging them to grow in in faith uh, in the faith so um, having faith is a personal decision which is what we would like all our children especially pastors kids to do um, if we if we've given them an environment where we are uh, uh, feeding them right um, you know nurturing them in faith and allowing God to work in their lives uh, I think that's what's most important so if you are a pastor's uh, son and having this struggle um, I'd say you know God God wants you to conform to his will or to his desire and not to the desire of, of man or uh, an expectation of a larger community. Yeah, I want to just end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Sid, did that answer your question? Thank you, ma'am, very much. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, we have five more minutes. Do you have any questions? We could take up one more question. Before we can wrap up, we can answer one more question. There's one there, uh, Diana. This uh, from Elisha. From Elisha. Okay, sorry, Elisha. Yes. Okay. Last Sunday during the worship session in my local church, this phrase "sitting on horses" came to me, and later I was referred to Isaiah 31. I felt this was a prophecy. God was wanted to speak to his people through me, but I failed to heal. I felt so much guilty after the service because I could not share with the congregation. What can be done about it? Uh, yeah, I open it up to our faculty team. Anyone would like to take up this question? Um, yeah, Lais, I think the yes, um, the thing you can do is uh, maybe just write it down and then uh, take it to the, you know, the pastor, the leader of the church and say, hey, this is what I felt last Sunday. Uh, can you have a look at it? And uh, if you feel it's okay, then, you know, the coming Sunday, um, please feel free to share it with the congregation or if you want me to come and share it i can also do that so you can you know um, it's not too late to um, you know present it to the leaders and uh, let them uh, you know, so that with that when you do it then you've done your part and then uh, then uh, they can decide whether whether it's relevant or whether they want to speak it to the congregation or just take it for themselves or how they want to use it um, um, of course, um, you just need to interpret the phrase correctly, uh, sitting on horses in the context of Isaiah 31. Uh, in Isaiah 31, it seems to be a negative context. That means they're relying on human strength. Uh, but some, I mean, so, you know, maybe God is saying, don't do that. Uh, but sometimes sitting on horses could also have a positive context, which is, you know, God is going to bring you, uh, undergird you with strength and speed. So you need to just interpret what you're hearing correctly. Yeah, is it the, you know, the context of Isaiah 31 or is it the context of God undergirding you with strength and speed? And then you present it to the leaders and let them take it forward. Is that okay? Okay, okay Pastor, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, we have a prayer request here from Herbert uh, that his left arm got summer frozen. It hardly lifts anything. It lost power and it all almost two weeks now. It's like no blood in it or the upper part. Kindly advise and pray for me. I feel like it's witchcraft. Okay. Um, Pastor, can I request you to please pray for Herbert and we can end this session with a word of prayer as well. Sure. Let's all pray together. Let's pray. Let's all pray for Herbert. I know we are in different parts of the world, but uh, there's no distance in the realm of the spirit. And uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that we could join together. And Together right now, we take authority over that infirmity, that affliction that's touched Herbert's left arm, every foul spirit. We command you to leave. And if there's any witchcraft behind this, we cancel it, we break its power, we nullify it, and we release his arm yes. in the name, yes. of Jesus, in the name of Jesus from that witchcraft, from that evil. Right now, in Jesus' name, that every pain, discomfort, uh, go and this moment let complete release come to his arm in the name of Jesus. So Herbert, try and move your arm because we are all joined together. We are standing with you. Uh, just try and move your arm and see if you're feeling better. Uh, Lord, we thank you right now. Let there be complete release. Let there be healing by your spirit and let uh, Herbert experience complete release right now, right now right now and let there be no more pain no more 
and that the arm be loosed to move yes, around Lord. freely in the name of Thank Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And we just Thank pray you. your blessing on each of us as we continue through this day. Let Jesus be honored and glorified in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How are you feeling? How about you? Uh, yeah. Um, hopefully, I'm going to get better. Amen. All right. Yes, yes. Mm. God bless you, Abbott. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, sorry about delaying posting the scripture. My system got hanged for a minute. Uh, okay, it's all set and fine now. Thank you so much for joining in today's mentoring. Uh, see you all tomorrow in the supernatural time. God bless.